Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Garijo, and, and I'm from the Information Sciences Institute of the University of Southern California. And today I'm going to be uh, introducing what uh, or different efforts towards creating knowledge graph of reusable research software metadata for making research software uh, more findable, accessible, uh, understandable, and reusable. And I would like to start motivating my talk by talking about the reproducibility crisis that we have been facing in the last years. I don't think I, I need to motivate you a lot about this topic in particular, but um, well, it's always uh, good to, to discuss why we are, or remind ourselves why we are doing this, right? And this was a paper published by Nature in 2016 with a survey, uh, with a survey with over 1,500 uh, researchers, and basically 90% of the participants acknowledged that there was at least a slight uh, crisis in reproducibility crisis, with over half of them acknowledging a significant crisis. These uh, respondents came from different areas, uh, ranging from chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, AI, etc. But what I thought was most relevant about these, this survey was that they also asked the question on whether their, their respondents had failed to reproduce their own experiments at least once in their life. And it turns out that nearly 50% of the people across all domains had failed to reproduce their own experiments at least once. This obviously doesn't mean that they will, they would always fail to reproduce their own experiments. That it, but if you leave, if you let that sink in, it tells you a lot about uh, that. Well, that there are many things to improve. So when we move into a computational sciences paradigm, um, reproducibility has three main pillars, and if we take the scientific publications. Um, these pillars are the following. First is research data and that is used for the experiments or produced by the experiments themselves. Second is research software and finally we have research methods. Fortunately, we have been seeing pushes by the community to make research data fair, that is findable, accessible, interoperable and, and reusable. And we have seen um, some repositories such, such as Figshare and Zenodo, those are some of the most famous ones, where you can just put your data, get a citation for it, and make it accessible for the rest. As for research software, we have seen more pushes from the community to actually make the code more available. And repositories such as GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and also you have a little bit more involved um, proposals from the com community-based proposals, such as the Apache Foundation, which gather requirements and community around a particular piece of software in order to um, leverage a more uh, reliable product. And finally, we have the research methods, which actually bring research data and research software together in computational experiments such as scientific workflows and we have uh, well many many different scientific workflow systems that that use them we also are seeing more uh, journals that are keen on providing a venue for publishing scientific workflows and scientific methods uh, such as the plus and method methods x for severe and we even have uh, social uh, platforms where workflows can be shared in this talk, I'm going to be focusing in research software because, well, we are the source venue, uh, but also because research software is the main um, focus or is the main artifact that you need to understand better research data and that you actually need to create computational methods together. And I want to focus on the challenges that we currently have for finding, understanding, reusing, and sharing scientific software or research software. And this comes from two main perspectives. The first one is from the user, from the software user point of view. And from the user, software user point of view, you always want to make sure that um, you, you understand the software as soon as possible, you understand what the software component uh, does, uh, if there are many functionalities in a particular software, you can uh, clearly understand which is the method that you need to use. 
you need to understand how to transform your data to use a particular software component. You need to know how to interpret the results produced by the particular software component because if uh, it produces results in a format that it's on the on a that it's impossible to understand, then it's very difficult to to use. Um, you also need to understand how to actually invoke the software without having to read over um, pages and pages of, of manuals. You need to know how to configure your software for the particular um, functionality that you are interested in. And this is very important in areas such as um, AI and machine learning, where the community has been, or at least I've heard many colleagues complain about how difficult it was to reproduce someone else's experiments because they didn't share the hyperparameters needed to configure the methods to actually retrain and reproduce the same results. And finally, uh, software users are also interested in comparing software with similar, uh, with other similar software. There, there was um, a paper published um, one or two years ago where they say that basically scientists find software in three main different ways which is either recommendations from a colleague, either um, reading states of the art, or by just looking at Google. And none of these approaches are precisely super, super good when it turns, when you actually want to, to see comparisons because sometimes, uh, well, you, well, when, when it's a survey, it's, it's sometimes um, not assessing the main features that you want to assess when you look at Google or you do um, searches in GitHub, these are often keyword, keyword based and not based on the different functionalities that the software are, are based on. And well, recommendations from colleagues are often incomplete, correct? Um, from the software designer point of view, um, then what the, the focus is a slightly different because software designers want to ease capturing the dependencies and installation structures of their own software and of course docker helps for this a lot but you need to know docker and you need to know what, how to make an appropriate docker image so we we need some guidelines that help uh, non-experts to create their their uh, reproducible components we also need better guidelines on how to encapsulate a particular software component. And you cannot imagine the amount of discussions that I've had with some scientists where they basically, they drop their notebook, they claim it's reproducible. And of course, maybe you can repeat what is in the notebook, but in, it's incredibly cumbersome to use with a different type of data. And we, we have to make sure that they understand that in order to be this to make notebooks and the components to be reusable, this needs to be considered and taken into account. Of course, um, how to make my software, how to describe my software to make it uh, usable by others. And what happens is that sometimes when you spend a lot of time creating a particular software component, you are so familiar with it that there are some implicit things that you think are so obvious that they may be for everyone. And what happens is that these are sometimes not that well documented, maybe because we don't have the proper guidelines to do so. So, um, well, they, they, this is one another thing that, that it's actually a challenge, right? What is the right documentation and how should it be transmitted to the potential reuse? And then obviously how to test if my component is ready to be used by others. And uh, how can my component be found by others once I've spent all this effort in properly documenting it, right? So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on three main things that we have been uh, doing in our group to address these challenges. First, we have uh, worked on creating machine readable descriptions of research software. Second, we have been taking these machine readable descriptions of research software to create knowledge graphs that connect different pieces together. And we have been finally building applications to help scientists find, understand, and reuse research software based on those knowledge graphs. So let's start with the beginning, uh, this, uh, creating machine readable descriptions of uh, research software metadata. We started this effort by going directly to, to the source. We started with conversation with scientists back in 2015 
and we uh, had a lot of meetings with um, many um, many uh, scientists in, in environmental sciences and geosciences in particular but well we we realized that many of the things that they were discussing and they needed actually applied to many other types of scientists and sciences and research software and basically what we did was um, create uh, six main types of metadata categories to help identify that is like identify was um, give a unique identifier to the software identify what was the website identify um, uh, what was the citation and so on and so forth how to understand the software that is um, getting getting additional documentation domain keywords etc how to execute the software that is docker images executables, where to get the instructions for installation, etc. how to do research with a particular software, um, which meant describing the inputs and outputs um, a little bit more thoroughly, and then how to get support and updates from the community. And we pose those as different questions, right? So for each of these metadata categories, which can be seen in the ontosoft.org website, um, you 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 can see that basically each of these entries in in ontosoft is like a huge questionnaire where which has been answered by scientists according to a terminology that is common for them so what we found out is that after that in uh, once we had the initial descriptions though those were great but sometimes textual descriptions are not enough for creating pure machine readable descriptions and therefore we started um, digging in into the description of the inputs and outputs and the software images and the executables and the variables that are used by the inputs and outputs to actually capture a little bit better all the metadata that is associated with a particular research software. In particular, well, we created the, we created the software description ontology, which in a nutshell captures the different software, software versions, and the different ways that you can configure a particular piece of software to make sure that you capture these different flavors and functionalities of, uh, of different software. So for example, if I have uh, configured a hydrology model to run in a region of the world for um, a particular basin, that configuration may be different <coughs> than another configuration in another region where there may not be snow melt. Um, because maybe in a region, um, they, they have a lot of wells and they, this, um, this have some input data that actually makes the results significantly different while in another place i just have the snow melt and i have to take into account how the water from the rivers will come into my main river right so these these are different types of inputs and they they, they bring in different configurations of the same software model and in order to do this we extended several vocabularies that are widely used by the community already one is the schema.org and code meta. Code meta is actually built on top of the schema.org. That's why I have the slash in the slide. And they are used to describe common scientific software or research software metadata, such as attribution, where is the issue tracker, where is the code repository, and so on and so forth. And what is very cool about is that code meta, they, in code meta, it's a community based um, vocabulary that has actually aligned different software metadata registries, uh, the fields in software, the different software metadata registries. So, so just by aligning and reusing code meta, we are aligned to many, many vocabularies used in, by the different metadata registries. We also use the W3C data cubes for representing data set specifications. That is basically the contents of the inputs and outputs, because well, it turns out that most of the software uses a tabular representation, sort of tabular representation to read inputs, either tabular or cubes, right? Because it can be n-dimensional. But what is important is that we describe what is in the tables, the variables that are communicated across um, this input that may be in whatever format it may be. And we use uh, the scientific variables ontology to describe 
the contents of these variables and actually to start linking different uh, software together according to the variables that they are describing. We use uh, the NASA QDT, which is a common vocabulary for units, and we use the Dockerpedia vocabulary to actually describe a little bit more thoroughly software images. So once that we have spent so much time um, describing research software metadata, the next thing that we did is to spend time in how to build knowledge graph based on this, uh, uh, on this vocabulary that we created. And we did it in two different ways. I'm going to start how we did it automatically. Why automatically? Because, well, it turns out that uh, reading all this documentation and then extracting the metadata in a manual manner takes a lot of time and I had to do a lot of that work and therefore I want to push forward uh, an approach to, act, to actually help me giving a, a documentation, in this case a markdown file, a readme file from a GitHub repository, extract as much metadata as possible. And we do it with a software called Someth, which is available in these links in the slide and to recognize up to 17 different metadata categories, such as the description, installation instructions, invocation, citation, usage notes, requirements, uh, contact, contributors, FAQ, support, license, etc. We take some of this information from the GitHub API, some other information is just by training classifiers, and some other information is just based on an analysis that we did on common headers that um, different researchers use to document their software. And based on this, we just integrate together and we give you a structured file in can be a JSON or a turtle file uh, with whatever, uh, with the, the results that we got along with the confidence that we obtain. And the good thing about this is that now that we have this uh, means to extract metadata, then we can start integrating uh, things from different um, repositories. For example, Zenodo has a public API, zenodo.org, in case you don't know, it's a huge public repository for publishing research data and research software. And they have a public API, so we um, just to do, a pro we did a prototype with over 13,000 entries, uh, only uh, focusing on research software, of course, and we expanded the metadata that they had with what we could obtain through some app from GitHub. And we created the source NKG, which expanded and integrated both graphs together. And actually, um, we are currently expanding it with Wikidata to make sure that we, for example, can connect better uh, the programming languages, the licenses that we use uh, in order to unify them and, and use the, the ones that are in Wikidata, which is a, a, another crowdsource massive knowledge graph commonly used. Um, and this is an example of what uh, the knowledge graph look like for, for a software entry. In this case, the, the nodes in the graph are the things that we want to describe, for example, the software or the software version or an author, and the edges that link the different nodes in the graph are the relationships between the, between the nodes. So for example, um, we have that software has an author and the author has a name and so on and so forth. And here we are just highlighting some of the things that come from extracted from GitHub, that they come from Zenodo, or that we added from Zosen because we are actually added a keyword based analysis to actually find commonalities based on the description and other features of the software. The next thing that we did we, is, was that we actually exploited the crowdsource capabilities uh, of, well, or, or collaborators and researchers um, to help creating a crowdsource knowledge graph with scientific uh, and research software metadata. And we did it we, by creating OKG SOF, which stands for the Open Knowledge Graph for Software. And um, we created a software catalog of models, which contains models from hydrologic, agriculture, and economy. And even though we have like, I think over a dozen models, uh, with their versions and configurations, uh, we, uh, it, the number of entries goes up to the hundreds, right? Because there are so many ways of configuring a different model for different regions. And now with the, platter, with the platform that we are building, thanks to OKGSoft, people can just go here, log in, 
um, edit their model and actually create their own configurations with their own data, allowing others to play with some parameters and then um, just publish it in the, in the platform in a collaborative manner. Um, what this enables is that now that we have captured all these metadata so thoroughly, we can enable unit transformations, we can enable uh, automated software composition, and we are also um, doing a little bit of linking with Wikidata, in particular with the variables and main concepts that are used together across different models. So how are we using this to actually help others find, compare, understand, and reuse research software? The first thing that we are doing is that, uh, and this is a snapshot of on the Ontosoft uh, GUI, uh, is that, well, just by having all this metadata, you can create cross comparisons that are very easy to, that gives you like a very intuitive um, comparison of, of what are the things that different software entries have. For example, here we are showing different uh, hydrology related products. Uh, some of them are models, some of them are other tools that um, are in general related to hydrology and that have different features, right? And thanks to, thanks to the different metadata fields, we can clearly see what is supported by ones and what's not supported by others, which may inform the decision of just going for one or the other. This is way easier to explore rather than having to read four or five different papers and then just come up with your own framework for comparison. Um, we are also using uh, OKG Soft for, uh, well, we have an application which is uh, models.main.isi.edu, which I invite you to explore. And you can, there you can find, compare and configure different software models and explore the different IO associated with them, explore the variables associated with each of the inputs and outputs. And um, we also have the means to configure and create new, uh, new model entries, but um, that's only for log users. So I'm afraid that for that you will have to contact us. And finally, another thing that we are doing, and I particularly think that is super cool, is that um, a much, much of my time often goes into discussions with the modelers so they can send me their right dependencies so I can help them and make their components a little bit more reproducible by creating Docker images or by, by making their components more portable. What we are doing is that we are developing assistance and guidelines so they can do it themselves. And we are using, um, we, are, we have extended um, a tool called Reproceed from NYU uh, to actually leverage um, uh, to create a virtual environment that basically users can use in a series of the steps to create um, a component that is completely reproducible. And we do so by, by following a series of the steps and one that helps them validate their, their results. And once they are done, we will save automatically a snapshot of their Docker images, their code in GitHub, and also an entry in, uh, in OKG Soft or Software uh, Metadata Registry. So you can actually execute uh, the component later anywhere. And even though you can use your or tool or tooling to actually reassemble the invocation command that we use to capture everything, we actually tell you the command. So if you don't want to use our tooling, that's fine. You can do it yourself. It's uh, through a, basically a Docker command. And this has been very successful with um, different uh, domain users because now they, they have the power to basically create the components themselves in a way that it's not, uh, so we, we are, it's completely following their current practices. They don't have to just change their environment or anything. They can build the component in their own machine and then we'll just ingest it in our system. So summing up, I hope that in this, um, in this presentation, I, I have convinced you uh, about how software, research software is critical for reproducible computational experiments and how we actually need to improve the findability, reusability, understanding 
and understanding of research software, we want a wider adoption, better comparison of computational methods, and in general, a better understanding of data products. And here, what I've covered are uh, uh, or approaches for three main things, uh, create machine readable description of software and so on its metadata that we have done through Ontosoft and the software description ontology, how to build knowledge graphs with research software metadata, which we have done with Ontosoft, OKG Soft and the SOS NKG. And finally, how we are using these knowledge graphs to help users find, compare, understand and reuse existing research software. And I would not want to end uh, my talk without uh, acknowledging uh, the team, starting from Yolanda Hill, who is the director of the group, Deborah Kidder, who is the data scientist, and also the person who tries all our tooling <laughs> and breaks everything. So we are very grateful to her. Varun, Maximiliano, and Hernan, who are the programmers, and uh, carry out a lot of the heavy lifting of of the tooling presented today. And with that, I would like to finish my talk and uh, my slides are online and uh, we welcome feedback and uh, new issues in our GitHub repositories. Thank you very much. <laughs>